Good evening. Welcome to our virtual Gallier gathering. We are the Herman Grima and Gallier Historic Houses. I am Dr. Anastasia Scott. I have the title of Director of Educational Programming here at Herman Grima. Gallier gatherings um, are being offered to you for free um, in this virtual platform. If you like our programming, please become a member. Membership has its perks. If you are not a Louisiana or New Orleans resident, you can take advantage of the North American Reciprocal Museum Association, where you can receive reciprocal membership benefits with museums and cultural institutions across the United States, Canada, Mexico, Bermuda, and El Salvador. Membership also helps with sponsoring programs such as this. If you join now, your membership is good through the end of June 2021. If you are impacted by COVID-19, we are offering student membership for $25 a year. You are also able to access our self-guided tour, courtyard tour right now and be able to tour both houses once it is safe to do so. Although the, so in line with the topic of alcohol today, we also have on sale in our gift shop, El Guapo Bitters and Syrups, which is a local company, a local women owned company. We also have New Orleans cocktail art um, from local artists. So just to tell you a little bit about Herman Grima and Gallia Historic House. Um, the Herman Grima and Gallia Historic Houses, managed by the Women's Exchange, aims to preserve and maintain the architecture and decorative arts of the homes so they may, um, I'm sorry, of the home's collective past and its contribution to the culture of New Orleans. For her talk, Cradle of the Cocktail, the Rise of Drinking Culture in 19th Century New Orleans, Dr. Kristen D. Burton will elaborate on, the hit, on why New Orleans is famous for its cocktail culture and cherished tradition of savoring libations. The origin of this culture stretches back to 19th century, a time when New Orleans emerged as the ideal location for the cultivation of drinks that captured the imagination of locals and visitors alike. Dr. Kristen Burton is the teacher programs and curriculum specialist at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. She works with the museum to create curriculum for educators and facilitates teacher professional development workshops in New Orleans and abroad. Prior to her role at the museum, Dr. Burden researched and taught courses on the history of alcohol and intoxication, women in history, and the history of medicine. She completed her MA at the hist in history at Oklahoma State University and her PhD in transatlantic history at the University of Texas, Texas at Arlington. Her book, Slow Yet Sure Poison, how Alcohol Became an Intoxicant and the Origins of, the tra of Transatlantic Temperance is forthcoming from Louisiana State University Press. So without further ado, I present to you Dr. Kristen Burton. Well, thank you very much, Anastasia. And I wanna thank everybody for uh, coming to or attending, logging on to this uh, talk tonight. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and uh, here in person, but also with you virtually. And I'm looking forward to talking to you all about a subject that's near and dear to my heart because I spent both my master's and PhD focusing on the history of alcohol, specifically with my PhD in the history of distilled spirits in the 17th and 18th century. So it was really fun for me to not only get to dive into this topic again, but to share it with you all and also to look specifically at the history of cocktail culture in New Orleans 
uh, which as if you've ever been to the city, it is inherently tied to uh, the city, its culture and day-to-day -day life. Now, before we jump into uh, where cocktail culture emerged in New Orleans and um, how cocktails came to be so closely tied to the city's history and day-to-day -day life, uh, I wanna give you a brief background on distilled spirits themselves, where they came from and how cocktails came to be essentially. Now, distilled spirits have existed in some form roughly since the Middle Ages. It was something that evolved out of uh, early scientific experimentation. Um, you know, some alchemists uh, got into the mix as well. Uh, but it has this long history in uh, the Middle to Near East and then eventually spread into Europe. But it remained a uh, activity that was uh, largely relegated to very small scale production to apothecaries, uh, elite homes, anyone who could afford the technology that went into the distillation process, uh, anyone who could afford a pot still or the ingredients to go into distillation itself. The very first distilled spirit that was produced on a commercial scale was brandy. And this came into being because of early experimentation with distillation. Uh, when early distillation started, people used wine as the base. And when you engage in distillation, the ingredients in the pot still are warmed to a specific temperature in which the alcohol will evaporate, but everything else will not. So water and other elements will remain within the pot still, but the alcohol itself will evaporate, carry up, into, so the pot still basically has a round base and it has something of a neck. The vapor will carry up and as it goes down, the neck will cool and return into a liquid form and it leaves you with a concentrated alcoholic liquid. So this is the earliest form of distillation and brandy became a commercial product because French winemakers and other winemakers across Europe saw it as an opportunity to take what would have been inferior wine, uh, anything that was corrupted or uh, unsuitable for sale uh, as wine on a, a competitive wine market, they could distill it and then sell what would have been wasted product otherwise. And brandy gets its name from a Dutch word, brandewijn, which means burnt wine. So this is the very first distilled spirit produced and it still remained something that was fairly limited. It was a favorite drink of the elite. If you think about the fact that most people, commoners, laborers, the poor, they often drank drinks like beer, ale, cider. Wine was typically reserved for people in more of a middle to upper echelon of society. So if the base of your distilled spirit is something that is already a little uh, too expensive for most people to afford, you can imagine that a concentrated form of that, that particular drink of wine uh, would itself be too expensive for most people to access. So this is the very first distilled spirit produced and it's highly popular in France. And this is gonna become important when we look at the early history of New Orleans. Now, things do begin to change as far as distillation and the history of distillation occurs with colonization. And it's through colonization that we get distilled spirits as a mass produced commodity that suddenly becomes accessible to all levels of society and will change the way people drink forever. Now with colonization, the main focus was in the Caribbean because the key commodity produced in that early era of Atlantic colonization was sugar. And I'm gonna share my screen so I can show you a few images and uh, while, I, while I speak to you about this early history of colonization. We'll go ahead and play that. Let title slide that it, you can enjoy for a moment, but anyway. So we're gonna take ourselves to the Caribbean circa 1650. This is where uh, the entire culture of drinking begins to change. 
As I mentioned, sugar was the key commodity to come out of the Caribbean in the 17th and 18th centuries. Sugar was highly desired and it generated high profits. So within the Caribbean itself, you had a number of powers competing over these islands, including Spain, Portugal, France, the Dutch attempted their own efforts at one point, and then the English get into the mix. So you have all of these imperial powers coming together into this one part of the world for the purpose of producing commodities and generating profits. And as mentioned, key commodity is sugar. As we see here, this is an image. Um, it's actually an image from the early 19th century, but the process of producing sugar changed very little from that time. Uh, it's from a, a series of images called 10 Views in the Islands of Antigua. So you can see here, this is the point where uh, sugar cane is harvested. And because of the colonization of the Caribbean and the interest in spreading and, and, and generating sugar, and uh, the rise of sugar plantations in the region, this also generated um, a stark increase in the forced migration of enslaved laborers from Africa. And if you look at the history of the transatlantic slave trade, the overwhelming majority of slaves sent across the ocean, sent across the Atlantic, overwhelming majority of these enslaved laborers were sent to the Caribbean, primarily for the purpose of producing sugar. So this history is intricately tied up into the early history of not only sugar production, but also the rise of distilled spirits. So you see in this image, sugarcane is being harvested. The moment that sugarcane is cut, the juice begins to degrade and it forces a intensive process. Once sugar canes are cut, they go into a factory and Early factory systems also came out of these plantation systems of the Caribbean, where you see after they extract the sugarcane juice from uh, mills, they would heat it in order to evaporate out the juice and extract the sugar. Now, uh, what you don't see in this image is after they pull out the sugar, and you can see to the right of the image, they're, they're raking out the sugar crystals, trying to dry it. They would then move the sugar into these clay molds that were shaped like cones, uh, like an upside down cone. And there would be a hole at the bottom of that cone. And then a vessel would rest underneath it because as the sugar would dry and cool, molasses would fall out of that sugar and then they would collect it. And molasses became key because it didn't take long before people in the Caribbean realized you can use molasses as a commodity in and of itself. It's a byproduct of the sugar making process. They're making hundreds of thousands of hogheads of sugar annually. And molasses is being produced automatically as a result. But if you distill that molasses, well, you have yourself a very powerful spirit rum i'll go ahead and stop share for a moment if i can see my mouse there we go all right so this is where rum comes from and this becomes key to the early history of uh, the new world of the americas but also of early cocktail culture as well because there's so much rum being produced people are drinking it by the gallons. I mean, it, the amount of spirits consumed because of the amount of rum produced skyrocketed. Again, most people didn't have access to distilled spirits. They were too expensive. They were reserved for the elite. But with the mass production of sugar and with it, the mass production of molasses, then distilled into rum, rum was everywhere and distilled spirits were cheap and plentiful. So people could access it any time, and it was primarily prevalent in the Caribbean and across North America. Now, it became uh, a drink, as I mentioned, accessible at all levels of society, but it was a very potent drink. I will say, the question I get the most when I tell people I study the history of alcohol is people will say, now wasn't alcohol a lot weaker uh, back then, right? Um, 
in some instances, sure. But when it comes to distilled spirits, that is not the case. In fact, today, dis distilled, distilled spirits and the distillation process is so regulated that, and the proofing technology is much more refined, that we can control, right, down to the percentage, uh, how much alcohol goes into a bottle of rum or whiskey. Back then, they were learning distillation as they went, by and large, and they're producing spirits on a scale that had never been done before. It was unprecedented. So they were cranking this stuff out, not aging it, not at all. They were just producing it because they knew there was a market for it and it would sell. So it was incredibly potent. Uh, there's stories that um, uh, even in the 17th century, someone who got too close to an open wine, or sorry, open rum barrel with a lit candle ended up igniting the entire barrel of rum. The thing exploded, um, which tells us it was incredibly, incredibly strong, but uh, scholars estimate that it could have been anywhere between 160 to 170 proof, which is uh, twice as strong, more than twice as strong than your average bottle of rum. So it's incredibly potent. You can't just drink this stuff. It's like gasoline. So a very common way that people did drink rum at the time was by mixing it. So this is where we first see people mixing spirits with other ingredients for the purpose of enjoying the way it tastes. The most popular mixed drink in the colonial era, and this goes from the 17th century into the 18th century, was rum punch. And I will share my screen again to show you one of my favorite images. Uh, let's share it. There we go. All right. <laughs> so this is an image by an artist named John Greenwood. It's called Sea Captains Carousing in Suriname. And what you see here is a scene of people, sea captains, getting absolutely schnockered on rum punch. And you can tell that they're drinking rum punch because if you look in the upper left corner, uh, you see an enslaved laborer handing over a gigantic bowl. And those bowls were very common in the serving and consuming of rum punch. You see in the center table to the left of it, the fellow with the red pants, he is drinking directly out of the rum punch bowl. And then to kind of the right above the fellow that's sleeping there with the blue jacket, he's just pouring the rum out of the bowl onto the guy's head. It's a chaotic scene, but this is exemplary of how much people were drinking, but also the fact that they were drinking rum punch literally by the bowl full. Now, I'll stop my share real quick again and come back to you. That is uh, one of my absolute favorite images and I love to share it anytime I can. Now, rum punch though, they had a, a very easy rhyme to remember the recipe. One of sour, two of sweet, three of strong, four of weak. And this is what I would argue is one of the earliest cocktails of sorts, even though they didn't use that term to describe it. One of sour, that was your citrus juice, lime juice, lemon juice, or both two parts of sweet, sugar. They added sugar to everything because sugar was in such abundance. Three of strong, that's your rum. Four of weak, and that is water. And they very commonly would serve this rum punch with freshly grated nutmeg on top. So that's one of the very first mixed drinks. It became so intricately tied to Caribbean culture. If you go to the Caribbean today, rum punch is still in abundance. People drink it all the time. But this has ties to New Orleans as well, because New Orleans is in many ways a Caribbean city. It is of the, at the northernmost point of the Caribbean, and it has intricate ties to the region. It didn't take long before sugar production, by the 18th century, sugar production made its way to Louisiana. Um, now, we, with the founding of New Orleans, 1718, by that point, the sugar industry was firmly established in the Caribbean. Rum was a firmly established commodity. People were drinking it every day. It was literally a wash across North America and in the Caribbean itself. Um, people have an interest and desire in drinking these stronger drinks. But 
New Orleans was a French colony at its founding. And because of those ties, initially the favorite drinks wasn't rum or rum punch quite yet, but wine and brandy. So brandy will be the preferred spirit in New Orleans from the outset. There is also another drink, I won't get into the details too much, but you also see a lot of references to Madeira. That's a fortified wine um, because French wine didn't travel well across the ocean. They would add brandy to the wine to fortify it, make it a little heartier so it could survive the sea voyage. So that was another very popular drink in um, early New Orleans. But brandy was the favorite distilled spirit. And because it's a Catholic city, it, by its founding, uh, the drinking culture was already embedded in daily practices. Wine is so strongly connected to Catholic rituals that drinking was already something that people did without much regulation in the early era. It's a bit of a contrast to, say, the Protestant colonies founded by the English, where from the outset, licensing of taverns was fairly and strictly enforced, depending on where you were. More puritanical, the stricter the enforcement. Um, and there were louder outcries of drunkenness in those areas, less so in New Orleans. And while there were licensing laws in New Orleans in the 18th century, they weren't always enforced. Um, by the end of the 18th century, by 1789, there were 94 licensed taverns in New Orleans, which New Orleans was still pretty small at that time. That's a fairly impressive number, considering it was a, a city that was 71 years old by that point. And almost anyone could run a tavern. Uh, men, of course, commonly did, but women could as well, as well as Jean de Coulet or free people of color could also run their own taverns in New Orleans. So liquor laws did exist, but they weren't strictly enforced. But the reason why I give you this history is because when we talk about cocktails, most people will look to the 19th century. That's when cocktails officially defined first emerged. But I think it's important to look at that earlier history and understand where these drinks came from because they do set a baseline from which people will build. Uh, going forward into the 19th century. Throughout the colonial era, there were a number of mixed drinks that were very popular. Um, there were slings, which essentially were a rum punch without the sour component. A sling was uh, your spirit, so your rum or your brandy, um, mixed with sugar, water, fresh nutmeg on top. That's a sling. Uh, another one was called a flip. <laughs> this, this dates back to the 17th century, but a flip was beer mixed with a spirit uh, and then also sugar, always sugar. But when they served it, they would heat up an iron until it was red hot and they would stick that iron into the drink, which would cause it to froth or flip. So it was a drink served warm. There's, there's so many more and I won't get into, get into them all, but they have fantastic names. Rattle skull, stone fence, cherry bounce. This is all in the 18th century. So well before we get into the 19th century and people defining cocktails or coming up with more elaborate drinks, there's already a long history of people mixing spirits with fruit juices, with uh, other, with sugar, but, but other flavors to enhance the drink to make it more enjoyable. But moving in to, uh, into the 19th century, um, 1803, Louisiana Purchase. Louisiana, which had been bouncing back and forth between French and Spanish control, officially goes to the Americans. Americans who have their own drinking culture move into New Orleans. And rum punch, which had been very popular in the Eastern Seaboard, becomes much more prevalent in the brandy-favored city. Um, one thing I do want to also mention before I move forward is when we look at this early history of mixing this kind of like colonial cocktails, um, if we want to call them that, it's really hard to track uh, what these drinks were because people didn't always write recipes down. Uh, 
um, more often than not, people wrote down recipes either for their own personal use or to keep within the family. People weren't producing recipe books the same, focused on these drinks the same way they would in the 19th century. So oftentimes when you look at this history, the 19th century seems like the start of it because that's when people started writing these things down. But before that, these mixed drinks were passed around word of mouth you know, in a more casual way. But history of the cocktail. If you live in New Orleans or you've visited New Orleans or hopefully one day soon, you'll be able to visit soon uh, in the future, you likely will have encountered or will encounter a very popular story about how one man who came to New Orleans is responsible for inventing the cocktail. And the story as it goes, you, I've, I've heard many a tour guide tell it on the street, is that a migrant from the French Caribbean named Antoine Peychaud came to New Orleans and set up an apothecary shop. At that apothecary shop, he concocted his own uh, bitters. And I'll get into what bitters are in a moment. But he would mix the bitters, a, a alcohol-based herbal concoction, and he would sell these mixes in a French cup called a coquetille. And the corruption of that word is where we get cocktail. If only history was that neat. Uh, however, <laughs> the first documented appearance of the word cocktail appears in a New York newspaper, not even New Orleans. And, and it appeared on May 13th, 1806. And I'll go ahead and share my screen again and share this quote with you. Because someone wrote into the newspaper in 1806 asking the editor, what is a cocktail? Which tells us people were using this word enough that someone was like, what the heck does this mean? And the editor responded in the newspaper publication, uh, Balance and Columbian Repository, quote, cocktail is a stimulating liquor composed of spirits of any kind, sugar, water, and bitters. It's vulgar, vulgar oh my goodness, <laughs> vulgarly called a bittered sling. And it is supposed to be an excellent ex electioneering potion and as much as it renders the heart stout and bold at the same time that it fuddles the head, which I think is just an excellent quote and a perfect definition of early cocktails. So this is the first time that the word cocktail uh, appears in print that we know of. Um, but what about Antoine Peychaud? Why do we know that he uh, didn't come up with this, right? Well, we don't actually know much about Peychaud's early history. It's pretty murky, murky, but we do know when he died, his death certificate listed his age as 80 years old and he died in 1883. So that tells us he was likely born in 1803. And while I don't want to undermine the fact that he was likely a very motivated and uh, <laughs> highly aspirational man, to come up with a cocktail at the age of three would be um, fairly ambitious. And I think it's probably safe to say the story tying Peixot to the, the origin of the cocktail is not likely. But, but Peixot is important, and he is important to the early cocktail culture in New Orleans. Now, colonial cocktails, as I like to call them, did continue to grow and evolve in early 19th century New Orleans. There is a key event that is really critical to the early history of the city and also the drinking culture. And that is at the end of the 18th century, a flood of refugees from the French Caribbean, specifically from the island of Saint-Domingue, started arriving in New Orleans. And what they were fleeing was the Haitian Revolution. So, uh, the French held the western third of an island in the Caribbean that they was split between the Spanish and the French. The Spanish called it Santo Domingo, their half, or their portion. The French called their side Saint-Domingue. This will become Haiti following the success of the Haitian Revolution. 
but because of New Orleans French ties, because of the fact that sugar production had already moved there, because of the similar climate, many French fleeing Saint-Domingue ended up going to New Orleans and set settling in the region. Uh, so much so that it's estimated by 1809, roughly 10,000 French people left Saint-Domingue to settle in New Orleans. And we, it's speculated, but not entirely clear, that one of the individuals who ultimately left Saint-Domingue, later Haiti, and came to New Orleans was Antoine Peychaud. So what do we actually know about Antoine Peychaud? Well, we do know he did arrive in New Orleans. Some wonder if he's actually from here, but there's good belief that he is from the Caribbean. Uh, but he came to New Orleans as a druggist and he set up his pharmacy at 90 Royal Street in 1841. And it was there that he developed his own herbal concoction and, and mixed it in a distilled uh, alcoholic tincture, bitters. Bitters themselves have a fascinating history and I'll keep this brief <laughs> as much as I could probably talk about it for hours. Um, but bitters have a long history and that goes back to the early era of distillation when people kept small pot stills either in their homes or they were largely found in apothecary shops because early, early uses of distilled spirits centered on medicine. They were often uh, mixtures made for the purpose of treating ailments, for um, warding off the plague. Um, and it, it, there's all kinds of assorted recipes. You can see in uh, old 17th century recipe books, um, these, medis these medical books, physic as they were called, physic books, um, these recipes where people take herbs, um, different kinds of flowers, different kinds of roots, and they'll put them into brandy, distill them, and it is medicine. And it will, they'll, they call them cordial waters. And so here is a cordial to ward off the plague, for example. Um, and this was the common practice of, of making and using spirits in the early era. And that medicinal practice carried through time. And that's what Peychaud was doing. He, get, he concocted his own mixture of roots and herbs distilled as bitters and, would, and served in tinctures. And the thing with bitters is, and those cordial waters even, back in the you know, 17th, 16th, 17th centuries, the portion size was very, very small. You would see recipes that say, take a spoonful at a time, very, very small. And that's still true with how we use bitters to this day. But he would mix his bitters and sell them as medicine. Now, Peychaud's not the only pharmacist who did this. This was a very common practice. I don't want to imply that he's you know, a trailblazer or anything. He was doing what basically every pharmacist did at the time. But the reason why his bitters lives on and why his bitters became so important to the drinking culture of New Orleans is because of another business that was located just up the street on Royal called the Merchants Exchange Coffee House, which opened in 1840, one year before Peychaud opened up his apothecary. A man named Sewell Taylor opened up this coffee house. It was a place where imported goods were brought in and sold, and people came in to get food and drinks and, and other imported goods. And one of the products that they would bring in to sell was brandy. And it, a specific brand of brandy that was brought in from France was called Sazerac de Forge a Fee. That should ring some bells for some folks. Now, the Exchange Coffee House, as it was known commonly, um, Taylor sold it to a man named Aaron Bird in, around 1850. And Bird was the one who jumped on the fact that customers coming into the coffee house were really interested in an in increasingly popular mixture of brandy and bitters. So people would come into the Exchange Coffee House and continually order a brandy bitters mixture. And at that coffee house, they used a kind of bitters that was made just up the street on Royal 
by a, a pharmacist named Antoine Peychaud. So Peychaud's bitters became the bitters mixed with brandy and sold at the coffee house. It became so popular, this mixture, that Bird renamed the Exchange Coffee House to the Sazerac Coffee House in 1852. And at the Sazerac Coffee House, it was known for having a huge bar, 125 feet long. It could fit 12 bartenders behind it. That's how many people were coming in to order this drink. But also, it shows that in New Orleans, People aren't just going to the bar to get a drink. The production of making a drink was becoming increasingly important. So it wasn't just about ordering, getting a drink, drinking it, and you know, leaving. It was about seeing it. It became a bit of a show. So showmanship became a process that became increasingly embedded in the drink making process. So we're moving into the latter half of the 19th century, which is critical for the history of cocktails in New Orleans. Around 1870, the Sazerac Coffee House was sold to a man named Thomas Handy, who was an entrepreneur in the liquor industry. He gained the rights to pay Shode's bitters in 1873. So Handy bought the rights to pay Shode's bitters at that point. This helped solidify showed the legacy uh, and gave those bitters a permanent place uh, not only in New Orleans history but in the making of a Sazerac cocktail. Quickly though, many who have had a Sazerac will know it's not made with brandy, not today. Why is that the case? Uh, this is a quick sidebar but at the end of the 19th century there was um, a bit of a pestilence in European vineyards and a, a type of aphid called phylloxera spread across Europe and devastated vineyards in France and in other parts of Europe. The wine industry was devastated. If you don't have wine, you can't make brandy. So wine and brandy imports fell off. Uh, it was so bad that uh, by 1890, roughly two thirds of vineyards across Europe were destroyed or just completely infested. But drinks still need to be made. And what was readily available in the United States at that time, but whiskey. So Thomas Handy at the Sazerac Coffee House made the switch from brandy to rye whiskey. Now, in this time, late 19th century, this is really when New Orleans became the cradle of the cocktail. We see an elaboration of the drink making process. Um, Sazerac's are today are not just brandy or whiskey mixed with bitters, far from it. Um, a Sazerac today can take anywhere between you know, up to five minutes to make. As cocktails became more commonplace, recipes became more involved and people began to focus more on flavors what different ingredients pair well together? How can an ingredient enhance the flavor of another component of the drink? This is the emergence of early mixology. Turn of the 20th century, a really popular spirit in New Orleans, popular with artists and writers, um, was absent. And absent, people realized that a nice flavor paired very well with Peychaud's bitters. And so people making Sazeracs started doing an absinthe wash on the glass before mixing the cocktail. And this is something that carried on even after absinthe, which was horribly maligned. If there was ever a spirit that needed its reputation restored, it is absinthe. Um, it does not cause hallucinations. <laughs> Although I would argue if you drink enough of anything, you will see something. But um, when absinthe was deemed illegal in the United States, uh, another liquor came to fill the void, Herb Saint. Still featured that strong anise flavor that paired well with the Peychaud bitters. Now, Sazerac, I'm spending a lot of time talking about it because it is the official cocktail of New Orleans, but it is one of those harbingers of what was to come. Late in the 19th century, we see other famous cocktails 
and this will not be a comprehensive list because this talk would go all night if we were to look at every famous cocktail to come out of the city, but some key ones. 1888, a saloon keeper named Henry C. Ramos. He came, I think he's from Indiana originally, but he came to New Orleans and developed an intricate new cocktail while in this city. And I, the, the Ramos Gin Fizz, uh, the drink he developed, really captures how far drinks had come from those early spirits, sugar, water, nutmeg, or early slings, which spirit, water, sugar, bitters, to the end of the 19th century when you have gin, sugar, cream, lemon juice, lime juice, and egg white, orange flower water, and finished with a bit of soda water. <laughs> it's an incredibly uh, decadent drink. Uh, I have a picture that I can show you of it. We'll go ahead and just bring that up real quick. So if you order a, gin, a Ramos Gin Fizz today, it looks like this. It's a, it, it's a production in and of itself, but the ingredients aren't the most elaborate part about it. The mythos and lore around this cocktail claims that bartenders would shake it for 12 minutes. Absolutely insane. Uh, Ramos reportedly had an entire assembly line of, of shaker boys, as they were known, to complete the drink. <laughs> this just shows you the range of how far cocktails had developed over the course of the 19th century. Now, also happening in the 19th century is the temperance movement. It gained steam by the turn of the 20th century. Um, it became increasingly popular. 1919, 18th Amendment, uh, enforced through the Volstead Act, um, affected the liquor industry across the United States. That being said, the cocktail culture was already deeply embedded in New Orleans and it had no problem <laughs> surviving prohibition. Um, Henry, Ray Henry Ramos, however, was a temperate man, so he did abide by the law and closed his saloon. However, the recipe does live on to this day. But the 13-year noble experiment did nothing to stop the manufacture and consumption of cocktails in New Orleans. People just had to be a little sneakier about it. However, with the passage of the 21st Amendment, new and more elaborate cocktails began to arrive on the scene. Um, one of the most famous examples and the last one I'm gonna talk about today is the hurricane. Now, like the Sazerac and like the Gin Fizz, the hurricane is a product of its time. It emerged in the 1940s, the mid 1940s. And it also features a spirit that we started this talk with features rum. And that is because due to prohibition and also the effects of World War II on the liquor industry in the United States, there was not nearly as much whiskey available as there once was. So bartenders turned to what they had available. And <laughs> if anything was not suppressed during prohibition, it was rum because the Caribbean, they didn't have to abide by prohibition. Also, People kept turning to the Caribbean to get access to liquor. So that 13 years where alcohol manufacture was illegal in the United States, the rum industry in the Caribbean began to thrive once again. So following the repeal of prohibition and following the end of World War II at a bar called Pat O'Brien's in New Orleans, a rum-based cocktail I'll go ahead and do this again. The hurricane came into being. So like a lot of cocktails that were created during prohibition, when people were often drinking inferior quality liquor, uh, they would mix it with a lot of sweet based mixtures. And that is true of the hurricane. So the hurricane also reflects this favor for sweet drinks. A hurricane consists of light rum, dark rum, lime juice, passion fruit juice, and today uh, people will add simple syrup, grenadine, and garnish it.
So these cocktails, these are just a few famous examples of cocktails, were born out of the history of New Orleans and they serve as a product of and contributor to the drinking culture that emerged from the earliest years of the city from its founding and have become synonymous with the city itself. People continue to visit New Orleans and hopefully again very soon for a taste of these famous drinks in the city that bore them and sometimes even from the very establishments where they were first created. New Orleans may not have invent, invented the cocktail, but bartenders in the city have crafted recipes that have helped to make these drinks truly timeless. So that is a very quick, <laughs> quick and dirty, but a very quick overview of the cocktail culture and how it came to be in New Orleans. And uh, to wrap up the talk today, and do a bit of a demonstration. So one of the things um, I do want to say before I actually bring out some alcohol and make a drink, it, I'm going to do a demonstration of a cocktail that's a personal favorite of mine, near and dear to my heart, but also harkens back to what we discussed at the very beginning of this conversation. And da, 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 da. that is an old fashioned. Why is an old fashioned called an old, old fashioned? That, that'll be the basis uh, of this discussion before moving into the demonstration itself. As I talked about over the course of the 19th century and especially in the latter half of the 19th century, cocktails became increasingly elaborate and began to feature a litany of ingredients, absinthe, orange flower water, fruit, fruit flavored liqueurs and other ingredients it left some customers longing for much simpler cocktails that may have harkened to mind from older than days gone by, if you would, um, so that they could actually taste the liquor itself. They didn't want all of the elaboration. They just wanted a simple drink. And an old fashioned is a play off of a bittered sling, the slings from the colonial era. It's similar to an early Sazerac. So with an old fashioned, you have whiskey, bourbon or rye, sugar, and bitters. And mixed with the ice, you have a little bit of water. The first, one of the first mentions of an old fashioned came up in print in, the 18, in 1880. And people would often go up to bartenders and say, give me an old fashioned cocktail. And this is what they meant. And now I'm gonna show you how to make one yourself should you want to make an old-fashioned at home. I won't get into how many I have made in the midst of this quarantine, but I think I've gotten a lot better at it than I was when this quarantine started. So here I have Sazerac rye whiskey, which is one of my favorites to drink. Um, also ties in nicely with what we talked about. Get yourself a nice little rocks glass. Um, you can use a sugar cube or simple syrup. I have simple syrup here, um, professionally packaged. And then you're gonna get your bitters. Angostura bitters is uh, commonly used with making an old fashioned. And you're gonna need an orange for your garnish. All right, carefully. <laughs> so. A little bit of ice that came in. So add a little bit of ice to your rocks glass here. And then that. Good. And then you can put your sugar cube in, or me, I'm gonna just put a couple uh, spoonfuls of this simple syrup. I don't like my uh, old fashions that sweet, but it's sweetened to taste. And that's good. Put in your bitters, just a couple dashes. And then you want one and a half ounces of whiskey or two if you're me. All right. 
And if anyone is a professional bartender watching this, please avert your eyes <laughs> for this lobby presentation. <laughs> but nonetheless, you get your drinks in your glass and then you're just gonna stir it to help mix in the uh, ice with this uh, particular, particular mixture here. But this is just an old bittered sling if you think about it. Not that far different from drinks that people would enjoy in the 18th century. All right, and because we like to be a little fancy around here, just take your orange and you're just gonna cut a bit of the peel off for a garnish. You can see the little, little zest to zest. That, put it in there. Yep. And that, my friends, is an old fashioned enjoy i hope you enjoyed this talk and i don't know if we have time for questions but i'm happy to take those if we do but thank you all very much for tuning in i really appreciate it oh my gosh dr burden that was amazing thank you so much um I'll go ahead and ask the first question because I don't see anyone asking any questions. Um, like I said in the chat, please um, use the Q&A feature to uh, submit your questions. So since we don't have any <laughs> right now, I'll go ahead and ask. I have plenty of questions, so um, you all can jump in at any point if you have any questions. Okay, um, so much. Oh my gosh, it was so good. I can't even, like, I don't know if you all were watching, uh, seeing me, but like my mouth was open half. I was like, oh wow, like mind blown. So thank you, uh, Dr. Burden, that was amazing. Um, I'll just start with the basics for like, you know, those fact buffs. Like I, I like to, I like to spew out random facts. So, <laughs> So of course, and people always want to talk about alcohol. So just to clarify, um, you said that, and I guess this is sort of a correct me if I'm wrong type thing. So was the rum punch one of the first mixed drinks? And if so, what was the first mixed drink? Well, that's a tough question to answer. Um, okay. It, in terms of mixed drinks commonly consumed recreationally, mm -hmm. it's up there. This, the early history of distilled spirits is fascinating because for the longest time people were making and consuming uh, distilled spirits in a variety of ways. Uh, I, I mentioned how that they were commonly made for the purposes of uh, treating ailments, uh, for medicinal purposes, but also people would drink them as cordials at banquet dinners. So there are recipes for mixed drinks that predate the rise of rum production in the Caribbean. But you will, if you have, think back to, um, if put, let's put our minds in a 17th century banquet table at a noble house in Europe, and you're sitting at an elaborately placed dinner setting, and you will notice there will be very, very small glasses. And they, they have something of a V shape to them, but they're very, very small and they hold about an ounce to an ounce and a half uh, of liquid. That would be the common serving uh, vessel for these early concoctions, but they were cordials. And so people would, in, in the same recipe books that I referenced before, where they would write down mixtures to ward off you know, a, a cold uh, to, to treat um, you know, pain of the head, ward off the plague. In those same recipe books, there will also be pure cookery recipes where people say, here's a recipe to make um, uh, an orange flavored liquor. And so there are mixed drinks that do predate rum punch, however, as I mentioned, most people didn't have access to those uh, those drinks, and more often than not, they were incredibly expensive. You'll see some of these recipes will say, in, you know, garnish with gold leaf. Um, people would also add uh, 
deer musk to these drinks uh, because that was considered an aphrodisiac, but it was also a highly perfumed, you know, oil to add to these mixtures. But they were incredibly expensive, very rare, and basically it was a form of showing people displays of wealth if they came over to your home for a banquet dinner. It was a way of expressing in a visual way how wealthy you were. But in terms of what people were just drinking for fun, for the purpose of recreational drinking, uh, rum punch is up there. It's, it's an early mixture. And today, even as I mentioned in the Caribbean, it's still incredibly popular. Uh, when I got to visit Barbados a few years ago, it, it was almost like you get off the plane and they're like, rum punch? And I'm like, well, yes, thank you very much. It's so deeply integrated into the Caribbean culture. People still drink it all the time um, on a daily basis in that area. So it's, I won't say yes, but in terms of accessible spirits that people drink in a recreational way, regularly, it's up there. Okay. Um, we have, listen, all it took was one person. Um, I'm glad <laughs> I was that person. We have a lot of questions. So I would encourage you all to start looking through the questions first to see if someone is already asked your, is already asking your question and then like that question so that it can bump it up because I won't be able to ask all of these questions. Thank you all. So um, let's see. Why did, why did rye whiskey become preferred over bourbon for the Sasseret? Uh, <laughs> the short answer is that because Thomas Handy picked it. Um, and, and today, Th Thomas Handy still has a, a presence in the history of the liquor industry. Um, and there are, I have to double check if it is a whiskey itself, but there are br liquor brands named in his honor. Um, and that's why I mentioned him is because he's a, important in solidifying the recipe for the Sazerac. Um, with the loss of brandy, he picked rye whiskey. Um, and so that's probably the simplest answer. Um, that being said, rye, I think also just pairs better flavors uh, that go into a Sazerac. Uh, rye tends to be a little spice, spicier where bourbon tends to be a little sweeter. So when you look at the ingredients that go into a Sazerac with the Peixo bitters and the absinthe or herb saint rinse, um, a rye just fits a little bit better with that. So short answer is you can thank Thomas Handy for that. Thank you. So for this next question, I do want to remind you all that in our gift shop, we have <laughs> um, <laughs> like literally behind uh, Dr. Bird and we have um, El Guapo uh, bitters and syrups a local uh, women, woman, uh, sorry, women owned company um, on sale. We are currently offering courtyard tours. Those are self guided tours um, for which when you purchase them, you will be in the gift shop and hey, pick up some bitters. This ties into the next question. Um, and forgive you French speakers, please forgive my pronunciation, but are uh, Pajou's bitters still available in grocery stores? Can you? Can you say it again? I'm sorry. Pay shows. Oh, oh pay shows. Yes, absolutely. You can get it at, um, if you, if your grocery sells alcohol, uh, pay showed is, if not the second most popular, it's, uh, among the most popular bitters sold in the United States. Um, I believe Angostura is the most popular. Um, I have Angostura here because that's what typically goes into an old fashioned. Um, uh, but pay show bitters are available. Um, and, and grocery stores and liquor stores and and I highly recommend I, I I have a preference for Peixo over Angostura um, just in whiskey in itself so I, I like to channel my own 18th century colonial ancestors when I drink at home and I usually pour some whiskey on ice um, I'll throw a little little Peixos in there too and it tastes nice but yeah you can you can buy it most places thank you Mm -hmm. uh, next question. Does the hurricane come from the glass shaped like a hurricane lamp? <laughs> so uh, what's interesting about that is 
there is some controversy con controversy over where hurricanes come from. Um, New Orleans, we claim it for Pat O'Brien's, but there are early examples of a drink called a hurricane that came out of New York. Um, but apparently it is uh, in that area where um, the glass shape um, possibly first emerged. Um, <laughs> so the hurricane glass is a signature element of the drink itself. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say Pat O'Brien's <laughs> the origin and, and you can thank them for that. <laughs> But that is a hurricane glass, yes. And uh, what, whether it came from the, the, from a lampshade, you said, or what was the question? Yeah, the burricane lamp. Oh, the burricane lamp. Um, that I don't know. I hadn't heard that before. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So many questions. Good I hope I don't get run out of New Orleans for trying to give anyone in New York credit for the hurricane. <laughs> Sure. Okay, so what role does drinking culture have during the early days of the revolution? Oh, <laughs> Ooh, that is a massive question. Um, <laughs> there, there are books written just on that alone. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get into uh, the highlights as best as possible. It, it, it's an in intricate part of it. The Sons of Liberty got drunk before they went out on, you know, their rampaging across Boston. And let's, like Sons of Liberty was a drunken mob. Like let's, let's, let's call on what they are. Um, you know, they, before the Boston Tea Party, they were drinking. Um, by the end of the 18th century, alcohol consumption was about five to six times what we consume today. Uh, people were drinking all day, every day. Even temperate individuals like John Adams would wake up every morning and have a tankard of cider with his breakfast. Uh, it was so deeply part of day-to-day -day life, no one questioned it. So alcohol and drunkenness and the taverns themselves played a key role in the American Revolution. There's a book uh, by a historian named Peter Townsend called Rum Punch and Revolution, which looks at the roles of taverns in allowing people to gather in public yet semi-private spaces to plan um, points of attack and organize and have discussions that fed into the larger revolutionary effort. Um, there is, um, there's a book called uh, Punch by David Wondrich, who's an excellent cocktail and his, liquor historian, um, which also looks at just the overall history of, of rum punch, but includes uh, elements on the American Revolution as well. And what's interesting about the revolution and drinking culture in the United States, the American colonies, and then later the United States is rum was so prevalent leading up to, and even during the, the war effort, the British engaged in a blockade and cut off imports from the Caribbean to the 13 colonies on the main North American continent. That, that is when whiskey became the preferred liquor. Benjamin Franklin said, whiskey is patriotic. It is a domestic uh, spirit. It is made here using American corn. And that became something of a, of a rallying cry. So whiskey gained an incredible popularity because of the Revolutionary War, because the British cut off rum imports. And it was, rum was associated with the British. Whiskey became associated with the new United States and a new sense of nationalism that followed uh, the defeat of the British. And that is when whiskey became an American spirit. So that, <laughs> that doesn't even scratch the surface, unfortunately, to that question. But uh, hopefully uh, answer some of it, but there, there's a number of really interesting books that get into the early history of um, the United States, uh, colonial America, and alcohol consumed during that time. So um, happy to, to offer further recommendations um, if there's any interest in that. <laughs>
Okay, thank you, Dr. Berman. Mm -hmm. Ooh, the mail is enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, don't forget, Dr. Burden has a, a forthcoming book uh, called <laughs> so, yes, sure. <laughs> How Alcohol Became an Intoxicant and the Origins of Transatlantic Temperance, um, forthcoming with Louisiana State University Press. So um, be looking for that. Um, it goes into the next sort of topic, and then I saw some other ones, but how did you get interested in this topic? Oh, oh, thanks. That's a great question. Um, it's, it's kind of a funny story. When I was finishing up my undergrad, I went to Oklahoma State University, go folks, when I did um, my undergrad in history, and then I went ahead and got my master's in history at the same institution. Um, so I had gotten to know people in the department pretty well. And as I was moving into the master's program, uh, faculty members kept asking me, well, what are you going to focus on? And I said, well, I don't know, I like it all. I love ancient history, I'm fascinated by the medieval era, getting really interested in colonial history. You know, I was all over the place. And so they said, well, you're gonna have to pick something. <laughs> you can't study it all, is what they said. Um, but at the time, I was working at, uh, at a bottle shop, uh, a liquor store, but we called it a bottle shop because you know we thought it was nice. But uh, while I was stocking the beer wall one day, I just happened to notice, especially with a lot of European imports, that they emphasized the history of the brewery on the packaging. They would say how old the brewery was, you know, brewed on the, in the same spots, and you know, 14, 25, you know, whatever. And it sparked my curiosity because I didn't actually know the history of alcohol. I didn't know much about it. And so I remember going to... Uh, a couple of faculty members who I was interested in working with when doing my master's and saying, you know, I'm actually getting really interested in studying the history of alcohol. And one of those faculty members actually laughed in my face because <laughs> she was like, ah, typical college student, you know? Um, so I was like, oh, I guess that's, maybe that's not something I can do. But then I ended up going to another faculty member and I said, you know, I'm actually getting really interested in like, what's the history of beer? You know, what's the history of alcohol? And she pulled a book off her shelf called um, Ale, Beer, and Brewsters. And it was all about how women were the predominant producers of ale and beer in medieval England. And she was like, hey, check out this book and see what you think. And in doing that, she proved to me that this was something I could study and I said, you know what, I want to do my master's thesis on the history of beer. And I, I did it looking at the medieval era into the early modern era. <laughs> and looking back, it's kind of insane, but my thesis focused from 1200 to 1700. Why I did that, I don't know, but, you know, foolishness at that age. But I looked at how the brewing industry in London changed over that course of time and how the introduction of hops affected the way people drank and perceived new kinds of alcohol and how they reacted to new kinds of ingredients. Um, and that became the base of the largest rabbit hole I've ever fallen down. Um, once I started studying just a little bit about the history of alcohol, it just opened new doors. And I realized that alcohol has been with people since before people even develop systems of writing, one of the very first that we know of, that we found, one of the very first written uh, pieces of anything in existence is a cuneiform tablet that has a receipt for beer. <laughs> so people learn how to make alcohol and, and ferment beverages and were consuming these beverages before civilizations and systems of writing came into existence and it absolutely fascinated me so i opened up this door that you know turns out you can study everything if you find the right topic and alcohol just became um it's it's all encompassing it touches on religion uh, economics social history political history cultural history gender, race, everything. And 
it's something that I have found to be an excellent lens through which to study any time period that may catch my eye. So I'm particularly interested in the way people perceive alcohol, which is why I like that early modern era of it because uh, drinking habits changed so significantly. And so when I went into my PhD program, I opted to switch from beer to looking at distilled spirits. So that was a really long answer to a simple question, but there you go. Thank you. So um, sort of tying into what you've already sort of briefly went over, uh, the next question is, what's the difference between beer and ale? You mentioned that in the history of drinking, mm -hmm. the lower classes drank beverages such as beer and ale and you know cider, while the middle and upper classes drank wine. Yeah. Um, so beer is historically ale doesn't have hops, while beer does. So that's the basic dividing line when you're looking at the early history of um, kind of beer brewing versus ale brewing. That's how people distinguish between the two. Now today, there are ales and they have hops in them. So modern ales are different from this historical brewed beverage. Um, ales, are, ales and lager, lagers are distinguished by the type of yeast used in uh, the brewing process. Um, but in say the medieval era, the more commonly people just drank unhopped ale, which it was considered women's work. It was like baking bread. You would make ale. And the women who did this were called ale wives. And they would make a batch at home and sell it for, for personal consumption, for home consumption, but also anyone in the community who wanted some ale, they could obtain it from an ale wife or they could go to an ale house, which ale houses were the common drinking establishments of the time. Taverns were more prestigious. That's where people would go to drink wine uh, at, at that time. But ale houses were like the common bar of that day. Um, so people basically lived off it. And when I say people, I'm talking about peasants. Um, pretty much anyone who wasn't in the kind of merchant class and up, uh, the laboring class, lived off of ale. And they used the term beer and ale a little loosely back then. Uh, children, women, and the elderly often drank what was called small beer, which if you brew a batch of ale and then you take that same mash and run another round uh, through it and brew another batch, it's weaker, it's watered down, and that's essentially what, that's small beer, that's what children, women, and older uh, people would drink. And more commonly, the first run is what uh, what men would drink. So uh, ale was sweeter than hopped beer. Hops have a bittering uh, flavor that it adds to beer. It also makes beer a more stable product, which is why all beer is sold with hops. Uh, today, unhopped ale is only good for a few weeks and then it'll spoil and go sour on you. So um, what my thesis looked at was how the introduction of hops into the brewing process in London led to industrialization of the brewing industry and also incidentally helped to push women out. Thank you. So related, um, the next question, did females have a preferred drink over men? It's funny you ask that question. <laughs> um, women and alcohol is a fascinating history. Because women have, I mean, women drinking alcohol is something that's been present throughout time, but women getting drunk was considered taboo in a lot of cultures over uh, spans of time. Um, in ancient Rome, a woman drinking wine by herself was considered taboo because it would imply that she was drinking to get drunk. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about a fascinating episode in English history because it's feminized, it was feminized in a way that other quote unquote historical drinking binges uh, weren't. And that is something called the gin craze. If you haven't heard of this, look it up. It's fascinating. There's a great book about it. I think it's out of print though, unfortunately, but you may still yet be able to find a copy. It's called Craze. 
by Jessica Warner. And she basically argues that it was one of the first like drug crises. Um, but essentially from the first half of the 18th century, 17, late, late 1600s, 1690 to about 1750-ish, um, there was this explosion of gin production in London. I won't get into the why in too much depth, but it was tied to imperial wars with France. So the English parliament loosened distillation laws uh, domestically, so gin uh, production took off. And uh, people were just drinking it by the pint, uh, by the court. I mean, it, it was so plentiful, it was so cheap. It was a parallel issue to what was happening in North America with rum. And uh, Ben Franklin actually made direct comparisons between the two. He said, we have just as much of a problem with rum here in America as they do with gin in London. Um, so it's an interesting issue, but it's especially interesting because there's a heavy focus on the fact that women were getting drunk on gin. <clears throat> and this was of great concern because as English politicians said, if women are getting drunk, then how are they to bear he healthy soldiers and sailors to strengthen the empire? <laughs> um, and when you see artistic depictions, there's a great propaganda piece um, by William Hogarth, Gin Lane, where the center focal point is a woman drunk on gin, dropping a baby. Um, it's a harrowing image overall. There's a lot happening in it, but that's the focal point. So it's, it's a fascinating episode. Check it out if you haven't read about it. It was feminized to the point that gin itself was feminized. It was called Madame Geneva or Mother Gin. Uh, you don't see this with other liquors. Um, rum was personified as Sir Richard Rum. Uh, whiskey was Captain Whiskey. And, and you see this appear in songs and poems and things. Gin was the only one that was feminized. So gin has this historical tie to being a favored liquor with women. Um, whether that's earned or not, that is um, something that women are often associated with, is gin consumption. That's so interesting. Um, times have changed because I label gin like a, like a chess hair, like I hate <laughs> gin. <laughs> I just don't like it because I don't like juniper, but <laughs> and I'm a whiskey drinker. And oftentimes women drinking whiskey, that was something that was like, people raise an eyebrow at, but now it's becoming right. more common. You're right. Times have changed. So yeah, like, oh, I can't do gin. But um, <laughs> relatedly, so there's several questions about resources. So I'm going to like kill like three questions in one, right? Um, so th this is the first question about like resources. Are there any resources you would recommend for Afro-Caribbean influences on drinking culture and cocktails? But relatedly, people are asking about like, what is the earliest known recipe book for cocktails? And is it still available? And another related question about resources is, um, Speaking of books, what is the earliest known publication of drink recipes? So all three of those are sort of related in terms of resources. Okay, um, I'll take the last question first uh, because it's front of mind. Um, it's interesting because cookery books and recipe books had been published in the 17th century. They were usually housewives guides, um, but they were recipe books and cookery books and they would include um, excuse me, recipes for uh, spirits, uh, how to make ale, beer, and things like that. Those are all featured in these kind of housewives guide books. Um, so those technically are uh, a form of recipe book. Um, cookery books were commonly kept by uh, elite women. Um, Martha Washington, you can actually, uh, Mount Vernon sells a copy of Martha Washington's cookery book. Um, and within it, you can find Martha's recipe for cherry bounce, which was an 18th century um, cocktail, uh, which you mash, pit and mash cherries, extract the juice, mix that juice with brandy, and then infuse it with cinnamon sticks, cloves, and nutmeg. Uh, 
So it's kind of a nice holiday drink. But uh, so those those existed, and there's you can find recipe and housewife guidebooks published as far back as the 17th century. They're much rarer and harder to find. Um, but moving into the 19th century, uh, to answer the second question, there is the name is escaping me at this time. I'm going to have to look it up, and I can get it to you. But there is one of those kind of famous early cocktail books when um, it, it's on the tip of my tongue, and I'll remember this as soon as we hang up the call, but um, where someone actually sat down and started writing recipes for cocktails. Um, I'll have to look that up, and I can share it with, uh, with everyone after the fact. But early 19th century, um, 18, I want to say 1820s-ish. Um, for the first question, uh, yeah, there are some interesting books. The one that I used the most in my own research, and um, I got an opportunity to, to work um, with this fellow. His name is Frederick Smith, and he is an anthropologist and historian who specializes in the Caribbean. And he wrote a book called Caribbean Rum. And in that, he looks at deep detail about the cultural influences uh, from specific regions. So he looks at Okay, so the French primarily engaged in the slave trade in these regions, the British in these regions, and he looks at the cultural ties that carried over. So it's an excellent book for that kind of, of level of detail to look at specific diasporas that came to form in the Caribbean through the intercultural encounters. Um, he also argues that the entire reason that sugar planters figured out that they could distill molasses and turn it into something that people would want is through the intercultural interactions between indigenous peoples in the Caribbean and enslaved Africans communicating with each other, interacting with each other. And it was something that indigenous peoples of the Caribbean had their own drinking culture before um, Columbus and his mess ever showed up. They had a whole litany of drinks that they made uh, and, and fermented to make intoxicating. So that drinking culture mixed with the drinking culture from different parts of Africa, which uh, again, that's a whole other area of, of study, looking at palm wine, which was really popular in parts of Africa. Beer drinking was a, an important communal aspect, the importance of libations. All of these things collided together in the Caribbean and that book goes into it in, in extensive detail. So that is a really one, that's a really good one to check out. The research is, is excellent. So it's called Caribbean Rum by Frederick Smith. Thank you. Um, so related to um, your answer is, um, what is the difference between drinking culture um, sort of amongst free people of color in New Orleans? Um, or I'll just say it how it's, because I'm trying to, Change. Let me just read it verbatim. What is the difference in drinking culture between free people of color in New Orleans? And say, well, yeah, that's what I was trying to make up. Let me, let me fix it. Let me add. <laughs> I'm going to add this. So that was the question. So basically, I guess, what, what was the difference between drinking culture amongst free people of color and drinking culture generally in New Orleans? Um, admittedly, there weren't a lot of differences in New Orleans. Um, for the Jean de Couleur, um, free people of color, they, as mentioned before, owned their own taverns and drinking establishments. Um, the Creole population was, it, it, it was a significant part of New Orleans and there were Creole families of high standing. So, um, and, and Creole doesn't necessarily mean, um, say, interracial, but it did uh, in, in certain instances. So New Orleans is a little unique in that way. Now, it's different when you apply that question to, say, the enslaved population, um, where drinking laws were much more regulated. Um, so while and it also depends on what area you're looking at, too. So this is, that is a complicated question. Um, I'd say in the 18th and early 19th century, it's going to be very different than the mid-19th century or post-abolition, um, right? So 
it really depends on when you're looking at these things. However, in the earlier era, um, like I said, drinking laws were pretty lax um, and not necessarily enforced. And you know, for the right price, a officer of the law may look the other way. Um, but when it comes to, say, the enslaved population, alcohol played an important role and it's a bit malicious. Um, this is something I look at um, in my book, which I do hope to finish this year. Um, but essentially, slave owners would use alcohol as a way, in their minds, of keeping <laughs> the people they owned under control. Um, this is something Frederick Douglass commented on um, later on, where he essentially said, you slave owners are using alcohol as a way of uh, eliciting compliance and, um, you know, docile behavior. Um, and it was a common thing where on Sundays, because no labor was uh, to be performed on Sundays, it was the Lord's Day, um, enslaved peoples would get rationed beverage, uh, alcohol, uh, beverages supplied by uh, the plantation owner, uh, the slave owner, and they would use that as a way of kind of like blowing off steam. So it's complicated. <laughs> in other words, one thing I do look at in the in that chapter where I, I look at the role of alcohol uh, amongst slaves is that um, it also did become a means of uh, resistance in that tying back to cultural heritage uh, enslaved peoples would use spirits rum punches and other um, alcoholic drinks as a form of uh, forming bonds there's evidence that in the there's a slave conspiracy that happens in new york in the 1740s and there's claims that the participants in this conspiracy um, made oaths swore oaths of resistance over spirits, rum punch specifically. Um, there's an interesting case of, uh, in Virginia, the um, slave owner, oh goodness, shoot, I'm, again, the name is escaping me, but he had a slave named uh, Nassau, who, um, maybe Bird, I can't remember, ah, oh, shoot. Um, again, I'll think of it as soon as this is over, but, um, this individual, he had a slave named Nassau, who, you know, we would look back and we'd say he had a drinking problem. He was likely an alcoholic, but also he would use drunkenness as a way of explaining why he wasn't completing his work. Um, so the relationship between alcohol and enslaved people is fascinating. Um, black markets emerged where um, enslaved persons would use liquor as a means of an exchange and could or in cases instances to stole liquor for to sell to sell use that money then to purchase their own freedom you know it, it's it's an incredibly complicated history and i don't know if that answered any part of the question that was asked but um again it's, it all comes down to context what time of, uh, of the city's history and the nature of race relations at the time. Thank you so much. Um, we have time, like one more minute left, but we'll just ask one last question. It's quick, I promise you. Um, what is your favorite New Orleans uh, location to have a drink and why? And we'll end there. Thank you all so much for your time um, this evening. Um, for cocktails specifically, a great cocktail bar, and I love this place. I love to go hang out there. I can't wait till I can hang out there again. The bartenders are excellent mixologists. That's a 12-mile limit in mid-city. Um, Cole, who owns it, is just a top-notch guy, and everyone who works there um, had, had to deal with me endlessly asking for my old fashions in a very specific way. They always complied. They always remembered. Just wonderful people across the board. If you're ever able to come down to the city, please check them out. Thank you. Um, thank you all. So thank Dr. Burden. Uh, I really appreciate your time and your expertise. That's amazing. Can't wait till your book comes out.
Um, and thank you all for attending. Uh, we will bid you a good evening. Uh, go ahead and, and have a drink for us. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. Thank you very much. Have a good night.